The Biden team should quickly pursue a realistic pathway to reestablishing direct bilateral diplomatic communications with Iran. That's the voice of Suzanne DiMaggio, senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. She's today's guest on Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. And now, here are your co-hosts, Michelle Dover and Tom Kalina. Welcome back to Press the Button. Tom, we're beginning the week with some really startling news. Yesterday, Iran's Natanz uranium enrichment site saw a power outage and a possible minor explosion that many Israeli media outlets are claiming was the result of Israeli sabotage. Hi, Michelle. And yes, this brazen attack reportedly by Israel uh, would appear to be an effort to sabotage not just Natanz, but the talks in Vienna where the US and Iran are trying to get back into compliance with the nuclear deal. So let's hope this adds some urgency to get those talks done, because the longer the talks drag on, the more vulnerable uh, they become to hostile acts uh, by those opposed to diplomacy. So both sides need to stay focused on getting back into full compliance with the agreement. Uh, But getting back to today's show, what have you lined up for us on early warning? Well, today we're looking at two issues. Last week, the Biden administration released its 2022 budget request, which includes a slightly increased request for defense spending. So we discuss what this might mean for nuclear weapons funding. And then we talk about whether we expect to see any shifts in the U.S. approach to resolving the North Korean nuclear question. So stay with us. And after that, uh, the president of Plowshares Fund, Emma Belcher, sits down with Suzanne DiMaggio. She is a senior fellow at the Carning Endowment for International Peace and chair of the board of the Quincy Institute. Suzanne has been working behind the scenes with U.S. and Iranian officials on ways to get both sides back into compliance with the Iran deal. And she and Emma discuss the ongoing talks in Vienna and what needs to happen for those talks to succeed. So if you like what you hear, remember to hit subscribe and leave us a rating. Every little bit helps us to grow our show and our audience. We really appreciate any feedback you have. With that, let's get into today's episode. The clock is ticking. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Thanks, Dal. Today, I'm joined by Emma Claire Foley, Program Associate at Global Zero and recent recipient of Plowshares Fund's Paul Olam Grant, and Dr. John Carl Baker, Senior Program Officer here at Plowshares Fund. Thank you both for joining. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. As you know, we have seven minutes to cover the week's nuclear and national security news starting now. Emma Claire, on Friday, the Biden administration sent Congress its 2022 budget request, which includes a proposed $753 billion in military spending, which would be an $11 billion increase from the year before. We don't have the full picture yet, um, including details about requests for nuclear weapons programs. But I know one area you are watching closely is the new ICBM program. What does congressional support or opposition look like for this program? I think the thing to watch on the ICBM question in Congress would be the bill recently introduced by Ed Markey and Ro Khanna, the Investing in Cures Before Missiles Act, or the ICBM Act. This was introduced with three co-sponsors in the Senate and 13 in the House. And essentially what it would do is um, cancel the ground-based strategic deterrent program, the GBSD program, which would replace current ICBMs in favor of a life extension program for the existing ICBM force and reinvest some of that GBSD money into a coronavirus vaccine. So as you can see, you know, this is motivated by increasing concern in Congress, um, among the public that uh, defense spending is outweighing the amount of money we've been able to invest in these key domestic priorities. We've seen some opposition already to this bill from members of the ICBM caucus, many of whom come from states where ICBMs are based. And I think we'll continue to see more of this moving forward as we talk about the 
budget more uh, in Congress. But if you kind of zoom out a little bit, there is growing support for canceling or pausing or reviewing the DBSD program, uh, both within the arms control and disarmament community and based on polling uh, among a majority of Americans um, who, when presented with the question, support alternative options to the DBSD program. So you you mentioned the ICBM caucus, and, you know, one of the reasons we typically hear in support of large programs like this one is the number of jobs they create. When it comes to the ICBM program, what does that actually look like? Defense spending has long been justified in the United States as the job creation mechanism. And you're really starting to see this shift, though, in the public perception. I think one of the most telling signs of this has been the popularity of the idea of a Green New Deal in the infrastructure bill that just came out, including the Civilian Climate Corps that was proposed. You know, this is a program that's been proposed over and over in recent years, and it's pulling at like 70 percent voter support in some places. So um, there's a real you know, interest in this shift. And I think that if you look at the way that companies like Northrop Grumman, which won the contract for the GBSD, presents this job creation rationale, you know, it's easy to see that it's often probably overstated or at least unsubstantiated. In his recent report, William Hartung cites the claim from Northrop Grumman that the program will create 10,000 jobs at 125 facilities in 32 states. But other research from the Cost of War program at Brown says that um, basically investing in almost any other priority, you know, infrastructure, education, healthcare, all these key, key things that we've seen really falter in the past year as they've been put under strain from the COVID crisis, all of that would create jobs more efficiently than the status quo method of just pouring more and more money into these weapons programs that there's pretty broad expert consensus that we don't actually need. Thanks, Emma Claire. John Carl, over the past weeks, the Biden administration has been conducting a policy review regarding the security and nuclear challenges posed by North Korea. This is happening as North Korea last month tested both crews and ballistic missiles. What do you think is important to watch for in coming weeks? Well, we don't know a lot about the details of what's going to be in this policy review. But one thing we do know is that it's going to keep denuclearization as a goal of U.S. policy. That's not terribly surprising. Um, But the devil is really in the details there, because what we don't know still is whether they're going to keep denuclearization as a long term goal and be willing to pursue a smaller scale, more realistic deal in the near term as a sort of first step towards getting towards denuclearization or whether they're going to do something similar to what the Trump administration did, which is essentially demand denuclearization, sort of unilateral disarmament of North Korea up front and then be willing to talk about uh, concessions, which in this case really means sanctions relief. So if the Biden administration is willing to keep denuclearization as a long-term goal, but make some realistic steps in the meantime, I think we'll be in a better position for diplomacy to actually happen. Because when the Trump administration demanded disarmament up front, that unsurprisingly went nowhere. But if they are willing to pursue a more realistic deal, that's going to involve some concessions on the side of the U.S. And so the U.S. has to be prepared to offer things like sanctions relief in exchange for tangible actions by the North Koreans. Well, with that, our seven minutes are up. John Carl and McClare, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Warner, and I'm the managing director of Plowshares Fund. Even though I've been working in the nuclear field for nearly nine years, there is still so much to learn. That's why I'm a dedicated listener of Press the Button. I so appreciate each episode where I can get the top stories of the week and a deeper dive into critical conversations with thought leaders and experts in nuclear policy and national security. I'm also a proud supporter of Plowshares Fund. Did you know that many of the guests featured on Press the Button are supported by Plowshares? Since our founding 40 years ago, all of our work is made possible by individuals just like you. Curious, committed, passionate. If you like what you're hearing on Press the Button and want to support the work of Plowshares Fund, please donate today. Whether it's $5, $50, $500, your generosity helps create a safer future free from the threat of nuclear weapons. Visit plowshares.org today to make a donation. Or join me and make it monthly. Whatever you do, stay informed, stay safe, and stay connected. 
Together, we can create a world where nuclear weapons can never be used again. Thank you for listening. I'm pleased to welcome Suzanne DiMaggio as our guest. Suzanne is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and is a specialist in diplomatic dialogues with countries that have limited or no official relations with the United States, especially Iran and North Korea. Over the past two decades, she's led Track 1.5 and Track 2 conversations to help policymakers identify pathways for diplomatic progress on a range of issues, including regional security, non-proliferation, terrorism, and governance. Suzanne is also chairman of the board at the Quincy Institute, an action-oriented think tank that advances a foreign policy centered on diplomatic engagement and military restraint. Suzanne, thank you so much for joining us on Press the Button. It's so great to see you, Emma, and be with you. And really, to uh, I just want to congratulate you again on taking the helm at Plowshares. It's so great. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, really a thrill to be here. Diving right in, what do you make of the talks that happened this past week in Vienna, where the US and Iran participated in separate discussions with other Iran nuclear deal or JCPOA participants? It was a kind of a shuttle down the hallway diplomacy. What do you make of that? That's exactly what it was, shuttle down the hallway. I like that. So, of course, since the Trump administration withdrew the U.S. from the nuclear deal back in May 2015, there's been virtually no official contact between Washington and Tehran because tensions have escalated throughout that period. So in an effort to overcome the impasse that was created by the previous administration, they've been following what I would call a proximity talks model in Vienna. The Europeans and others are facilitating communications between the Iranians and U.S. officials. It's a creative solution as the Iranians refuse to meet the American officials yet. Um, The good news is that both Iran and the U.S. agree on the goal of reviving the deal through a full return to commitments by all of the parties. But given the high degree of mistrust in the U.S.-Iran relationship and the complexities involved, which are extensive, getting there is not going to be easy. But it seems some progress has been made so far on resolving what I call the who goes first dilemma. Uh, There's interest in pursuing a comprehensive implementation approach. So two roadmaps will be produced outlining the measures and timing for the full return to compliance by Iran and the U.S., I think it's a promising approach because the goal is to provide full clarity on the end game. A simultaneous process means neither side has to go first. So far, the parties reached agreement to establish two working groups. One is focused on the process for lifting sanctions by the U.S., and the other is focused on what steps Iran will take to bring its nuclear program back into compliance. An agreement was also reached to continue the talks in Vienna. So that's a very positive sign. Um, There have been some indications of a slightly more flexible approach by the Biden administration. They're now saying we can go step by step or some other way. And the Iranians now are saying, okay, then let's tackle this in one big step. So working out the roadmaps and the implementation are the next steps. It's a lot of heavy lifting ahead. But I think it's doable as long as the political will to get there on both sides remains in place. So there is a lot of attention on these talks in particular. And as you note, they'll be continuing next week, which is a great sign. But these talks are really the closest we've seen to a public meeting between Iranian and US officials since the Biden administration assumed office. So where do we stand with diplomacy more broadly between the United States and Iran? So when the Trump administration withdrew from the JCPOA, um, it also made the short-sighted move with that of severing communications with the government of Iran because the joint commission of the JCPOA was the main mechanism through which we communicated with the Iranians for official dialogue. So these indirect talks in Vienna, as I said, are creative attempt to overcome the deadlock. Uh, It's a solution for now, but it's not a long-term fix because even with the best interlocutors, the possibility of miscommunications and misunderstanding is very great. It's like 
when we were little and we'd play that game of telephone. By the time the message got to you, it was uh, something different. Uh, so the Biden team should quickly pursue a realistic pathway to reestablishing direct bilateral diplomatic communications with Iran. And when we look at Iran's political calendar, um, the goal should be to accomplish this and as much as possible before the Rouhani administration leaves office this summer. Um, I also want to make the point that, you know, I'm glad to see the Biden administration is now pursuing a return to the JCPOA with a lot more urgency than we've seen. Uh, Vienna, in a lot of ways, I think is a course correction for the Biden team to get diplomacy on track with the U.S. Since it was the U.S. that left the deal in the first place, the easiest way forward for the Biden team would have been to announce the reversal of Trump's withdrawal early on through an executive order. They could have included it among the other America's back moves during the first few weeks following the, the inauguration. I think this would have been very quickly followed up by a statement from the Iranians announcing their intention to return to a full compliance. But instead, uh, Team Biden waited. So it's more complicated now. Uh, of course, the sharp move away from the chaotic personality-driven decision-making of the previous four years is certainly welcome. But I think the Biden team got bogged down in an overly deliberative process that almost led them to miss the opportunity to restart diplomacy with Iran. So uh, Vienna is a good step forward to correcting that mistake. Thanks, Suzanne. So you said that the Biden team got bogged down in an overly deliberative process. Why did that happen? And what are some of the elements that you think that they were deliberating? Well, I think they came into office and instead of moving quickly, they decided to open the question up for debate on whether or not to just dive in and uh, revive the JCPOA in a quick, clean way, or consider using what some call the leverage inherited from the Trump sanctions to get a bigger, better deal. Uh, I think they also felt um, some pressure to consult widely. So not only with our European allies, of course, the Chinese and Russians who are also parties to the deal, but also our Gulf allies, Israel and others. And then of course, those on the Hill that have been you know, not as supportive of the JCPOA. And then what we saw happen was the Biden administration really rightfully placed an emphasis on domestic issues, um, particularly passing the American Rescue Plan COVID relief bill, which arguably will be uh, the signature um, event of the Biden administration. So now they've passed that. They wanted to maintain unity among the Democrats to do that. But when we look at Biden's uh, approval ratings, they're really quite high. The favorability ratings are quite high. So passing the bill getting um, these high ratings, maybe now they feel more comfortable pursuing something that's a little more controversial, uh, not directly related to domestic policies, although an argument could be made, um, we're avoiding a conflict with Iran, um, which inevitably will hit us at home in some way. Um, so I think there's an openness now to doing it. Uh, it's made it a little bit more difficult because the Iranians political calendar has moved ahead and their room for negotiation diplomacy has shrunk. Uh, but here we are, and I'm glad to see that the Biden administration has come around to it and hopefully will stick with it. What happens if they aren't able to create a, a roadmap? Uh, what then? I'm usually an optimistic person, but I think absent a breakthrough on getting the JCPOA reconstituted, it seems very likely that Iran will seek to increase its own leverage by further expanding its nuclear activities, um, placing restrictions on IAEA inspectors, um, and perhaps even ramping up their activities in the region that undermine U.S. interests. When you look at the political dynamics inside Iran, uh, where the hardliners are ascendant, it is unsettling. 
Uh, they are moving the country into what could be uncharted political territory. Um, and after the June presidential elections, I think unless we've made some progress on reconstituting the deal, Iran is going to be facing fundamental decisions of how to confront what they perceive as a mounting alliance against their security. And in such a scenario, the Iranians likely will draw on their growing capacity to fight asymmetrical wars with even better armed proxies. Their significantly upgraded ballistic missile systems might play a larger role. Uh, their impressive hybrid cyber warfare capabilities, which present a growing threat to not only the neighbors, but also our interests. So constraining uh, the nuclear activities of Iran obviously has to be the priority. And that's what the JCPOA accomplished and can accomplish again. But I also see getting back into this deal as an opportunity to pursue a strategic opening with Iran on some of these other issues that I've mentioned. And certainly looking to extend the deal would be one of them but also maybe tackling some of the um, disagreements that we have with them in the region in particular. So Suzanne, I'd love to return to something that you'd mentioned earlier, which is uh, the United States image. Part of this effort to resume talks is the context that the US is working in. And the international community has an understandable distrust for US efforts at diplomacy after the past four years, where the administration withdrew from agreements that were working such as the Iran nuclear deal and the Paris Climate Agreement uh, in the way that you'd referenced before. Given all of this, what can the US do to restore its image? There's a lot we can do, and frankly, we're going to have to do. But just in a nutshell, I would pose it this way. Don't take hard-won agreements achieved through painstaking diplomacy for granted protect them, nurture them, and most importantly, build on them through more painstaking diplomacy. So what I'm talking about is very hard work. There are no shortcuts. Um, getting back into the Paris Climate Agreement was the right move, and that's going to require a lot of work. John Kerry's out front uh, representing us and getting uh, those activities up and running. Our return to the WHO during as we come out of this COVID pandemic is very important and so forth. Uh, the way the Biden team has put it, America's back, diplomacy is back. Those are fine words. Now we have to put actions behind it. And I think the effort to revive the JCPOA is being welcomed in the same way. You know, keep in mind that the JCPOA was the result of more than a decade of diplomatic talks, especially the Europeans early on led this effort and did the heavy lifting. Um, the Trump administration tossed the deal aside very easily and so recklessly. They had the full support from Republicans in Congress, as well as a few Democratic hawks, which is just unacceptable. Shame on them. Um, the JCPOA was and hopefully will again be a model for major powers working together to peacefully resolve an issue that they all viewed as a potential threat, namely Iran's nuclear program. Uh, I call it restraint in action. Um, for, fortunately, we now see the Biden administration focused on this with an intention to build on it. And the building on it part is very important. Uh, during the a relatively productive time, let's assume we get back in the deal, we should be pursuing more with the Iranians. I wish both sides did this during the Obama administration. I wish there had been a more assertive focus on gaining more wins in that relationship after the JCPOA was reached. And uh, kudos, by the way, this is a different subject, but uh, to the Biden team, kudos for pursuing the extension of new strategic arms reduction treaty, New START, as an early priority. The only remaining arms control agreement between the US and Russia, which was set to expire in February, extended it for five years. Well, I know we're not talking about North Korea, but I spend a lot of time looking at that country. And I would advise the Biden team to do something similar there. 
don't throw away the Singapore declaration that came out of the 2018 summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un. Build on that too. I know there will be a, a knee-jerk reaction to just discard it, but it could be a statement of principles to move forward on future diplomacy with North Korea. So my approach to this question you've asked, Emma, is really stick with diplomacy, stick with the agreements we've reached, even if they become a little outdated, uh, rebuild them, work on them, don't discard them. Terrific. That really segues very well into my final question for you, which is, you know, you've been doing this work for many years during times of maximum pressure and active talks. What lessons have you drawn from those experiences that are informing your work right now? Well, I think as I previously mentioned, when times are good, keep building. Uh, don't stop. Uh, be obsessive about it. But I do spend a lot of time thinking about this, and there are so many lessons. I want to concentrate on just one key lesson that relates to sanctions and how we utilize them. In my mind, sanctions should be viewed as the means to reach an end goal, usually a change in policy. We saw the Trump administration pursue a draconian approach to sanctions without ever offering an off-ramp for serious diplomacy with Iran. Fortunately, the Biden administration is undertaking a review of U.S. sanctions policy. This review is looking at whether U.S. sanctions programs are achieving their stated goals. And in the case of Iran, I think we already know the answer to that review. It's clearly no. The centerpiece of maximum pressure has been actually the misuse of sanctions. The result has been an absolute failure. We've seen Iran expand its nuclear activities while tensions in the region have escalated, undermining U.S. interests on a range of fronts. Um, this approach also has led to unintended humanitarian consequences, namely blocking the provision of food, medicine, medical equipment, other humanitarian items. And this is continuing today as ordinary citizens in Iran are confronted with the fourth wave of COVID. Um, so that is a, a lesson, a hard lesson I think we have to learn is really to rethink how we utilize sanctions. And then um, just to turn to my own work, I think a lesson I continue to learn time and time again uh, in the age of COVID is the value of sustained face-to-face -face dialogue, especially with those that we have categorized as adversaries. There is no substitute. I thought that before COVID, <laughs> I think it especially true while we're coming out of COVID, fingers crossed. Uh, given the sensitivities associated with the kinds of dialogues I'm engaged with, we've relied um, to a great extent on face-to-face, in-person communications over the years. And after the pandemic hit, we were able to quickly transition from in-person meetings to virtual gatherings and other communications. Um, but then we were able to resume in-person meetings in back in September 2020. And this was thanks to the heroic efforts of a European government who created a safe, low-key dialogue bubble for us. Um, the fact remains that some aspects of this work can't be replicated virtually or through interlocutors. And as I look ahead um, to the resumption of normal circumstances, I believe we will not fully return to the previous working methods. Instead, we'll likely land on some hybrid but the lesson, the big lesson and takeaway for me is nothing will ever replace the face-to-face. -face. Well, thank you so much, Susan, um, for a really interesting interview with great insight. And thank you also for all of the work you do. That's critically important. And we very much appreciate that. So thanks for spending some time with us today. And we wish you all the best in your future work in this really critical area. It was an absolute pleasure to be with you, Emma. And thank you, Plowshares, for all you do. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced and edited by Derek Sender, Will Lowry, and Delphine Vigil, with research and assistance from Doreen Horshig and Harry Tarpey. Sound design by Derek Sender. Audio engineering 
by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.